Okay, I just want to say um, thank you for joining us on our Zoom uh, meeting tonight. And, and welcome to the House of God in Gordonsville. <clears throat> We're going to ask Pastor Frank West if he was lead us in our evening prayer. Yes, sir. Father, we thank you and bless you and praise you again for this opportunity to be in your presence. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit that you've given us. We bless you for this time and this opportunity that you've given us to come, your people to gather. Father, we ask that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds and our spirits to receive what it is that you would have for us, Father. Bless us to be edified by your word and through your spirit. Bless the one that is, uh, that is bringing this forward tonight, Father. Anoint him. We thank you for his anointing. We thank you for everything that you've done, Father, and help your people, Father, that we would receive it and that we would hide your word in our heart to ensure that we don't sin against you, Father, and that your word would be that seed that falls on good ground, bringing forth much fruit for the upbuilding of your kingdom. These blessings we ask, we pray. We believe by faith in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Wes. Uh, <clears throat> we are so grateful and honored to um, have Apostle uh, G. Randolph Daly, who is the assistant to our Chief Apostle Thomas Clark. Um, some of you may or may not know, but this book I'm holding in my hand, is, it is, he is the author of the core values of Hebrew Pentecostalism. Um, he and Cobham, we're going to start a series of the core values discussion and Vicka Preston and I have been talking about it. And so we decided we wanted to do this. And, that, and as an afterthought, I said, before we get started in our weekly teaching of the core values, we, we had asked uh, Apostle Daly, if he, who penned the core values, who had the background, the, mess, the why we were doing it. Um, so we invited him on tonight. I, as I look at the audience tonight, we have several pastors and we have several um, district state superintendents who are on also, and we thank God for you all joining us. I'm going to um, give it to Apostle Daly, and he would tell us the format that he preferred to use. Uh, and he, what he's going to do, he's going to give us an overview. And I know you may have many, many questions, and he'll tell us, uh, instruct us whether he wants to give his overview and then entertain questions uh, later, or he wanted to have a, an exchange ongoing. So, uh, Pastor Daly, again, thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us and you and Lady Daly. And we are going to now give it to you. And if you would, tell us how you would like to handle this. Well, first of all, uh, let me thank you for inviting me and having me on tonight. Um, I know that there were many other choices that you had, but you selected an old man, and um, I'm certainly honored um, by that. I hope that what we have to, to offer will be of benefit or help to someone, uh, but I think uh, that it's a good topic. The core values have been around for some time and was born out of a real need in the House of God Church. And um, uh, so, uh, and I hope that you, can you hear me first of all, before I go too far? Yes, sir. All right, that's very good. And can you, um, I apologize for the setup. My granddaughter set this up for me. Um, my, I've got a new monitor that my old monitor had a camera embedded in it and uh, gave a much better um, control of the uh, video and audio but uh, I'm having to use my cell phone uh, sitting on the desk, which it makes it a little bit awkward. And I just hope that you can see and hear me. Uh, that being the case, um, I, I intend to um, give a little bit of background because I think it's important to understand uh, why we have four va uh, 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 core values and how we got there. And uh, so it may take me a, a minute or two to get through that to give you some background and then to take you through what those values are and why they are, why they um, they represent us. 
and then I will stop. Now, I, I was not aware of how, how much time we have. Uh, you can help me out there, Apostle. How much time are we looking at? Um, also, on our Friday night Bible study, we go from anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. So however much time you need, um, if that's not enough, whatever, whatever amount of time you would need, um, we're here just to... Um, just for the, enjoying the fact that you have so, um, chosen to share this time with us. So it's, it's your time. Well, let, let me do it this way. I will try to do a complete overview. I hope it doesn't take too terribly long, but um, since you're going to be doing a series on this anyway, um, I want to get to the main points uh, to elucidate uh, why, why there are core values uh, and hope and in hopes that that will um, stimulate a narrative or a dialogue uh, among you, those of you who want to study it further, but to go not to spend too much time going into the, the, uh, the detail of it, because I'm, I'm sure most of you um, are aware of it anyway. But um, I think that we need to start with core, uh, with the core values or values. What, what are they, you know? And, um, the um, values, uh, first of all, are something that we hold uh, in high regard, uh, something that deserves importance and uh, is um, something that is, is useful to us. They are principles in some cases and standards of behavior. Uh, it represents uh, a high level of judgment and the importance of things in our lives in some cases. Uh, categorically, uh, there, there, there are many different values. There, there, there are personal values, there are spiritual values, there's corporate values. I'm not going to talk about all of them uh, because people often ask, uh, are there more than, um, more than five values as we have? And, and my answer is there are thousands of values and you can place them in all kinds of categories, but we chose five uh, to try to, to assist in solving a problem that we had, and I will get to that. Um, the House of God was um, formulated in 1918 by Bishop R.R. Johnson. The church came together during the uh, Reformation, and I call it the Reformation for those of us who are biblical scholars and students know that in the early uh, 1900s, there was a uh, Pentecostal movement that took place in 1904, I believe it was in Los Angeles, California. Um, it was called the Azusa Street Movement and uh, was headed up by William Seymour, a blind or one eye uh, preacher at the time. What was significant about that revival and that meeting was that the Holy Ghost, uh, although it had been in existence from creation, from its creation, back in uh, Acts chapter two, uh, the Holy Ghost uh, fell and, and was widely recognized by many. So from that meeting in Azusa Street, there were many organizations that came out of the Azusa Street movement, uh, notable of which is the, uh, the Church of God. Uh, I mentioned them because uh, from the Church of God came the Church of God in Christ. Church of God was principally white, Church of God in Christ was led uh, by, came out uh, as a uh, African-American, uh, predominantly African-American group. Then there was the, the founders of PAW and, and many, many more that came out of that, um, out of the Azusa Street movement. Our founder, Bishwari R. Johnson, there is no record of him having anything to do with uh, the Azusa Street movement. He nonetheless um, uh, was uh, connected in some way with those who uh, experience the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and other things, and I'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, those, those who came out of Azusa Street, who became uh, and accepted the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, such as it was, as the part uh, of their doctrinal tenets, um, those who came many years who became uh, and accepted the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, such as Oh, I'm, I'm getting feedback from somewhere. I'm sorry. I thought it was someone's talking to me. No, it was, it was you. Somebody recorded apparently in this. Oh, yeah. Back. I heard my, 
heard myself uh, talking again. Um, we're labeled a, a simply a, a, as holiness uh, then and then later Pentecostals uh, for those that accepted the Holy Ghost. Um, they were in the, in the Church of God, for instance, uh, Church of God and the Church of God Seventh Day at that time. Uh, they were several observers who had um, among them Herbert W. Armstrong and Ellen White and others, uh, including our own uh, Bishop Rufus Abraham Reed and uh, Alaska Smith and so forth that, that came out of that organization. But that becomes important because many of the tenets that we hold dear today and subscribe to had its genesis inside those organizations. Now, I mention that because this is all documented. Um, there's a book called The History of the Church of God, Seventh Day, written by Andrew Duggar. For those of you that want to go out on the internet, on, on Amazon or whomever to get it, it's a large book. There's a lot of information in it, but these this is a place where you can find uh, much of the information that I just spoke to. Um, and some of you may want to research it for yourselves. Um, this, 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 uh, this is important to know because for many years we, we were given information about our organization that just under research did not hold up. And uh, I, would, I would encourage most of you to uh, research that. Uh, roughly 34 years ago, however, Bishop S. P. Rawlings uh, who was then chief apostle of our organization, um, made a declaration that we, uh, the house of God, uh, we, Holy Church of the Living God, was going to be known denominationally as Hebrew Pentecostal. Um, if you looked at our organization at that time, it was made up of a, a lot of different uh, people. Uh, when I say that, uh, all Sabbath keepers, all Holy Ghost filled and so forth, but we had a variety of beliefs uh, systems. There were some that were wearing yarmulkes and tali, some uh, with long robes and staffs in their hands and so forth. So when you look back on that, that reflected the, the fact that there was a, a, a wide variance or in, in the belief systems of, of the, the house of God. But um, he uh, attempted to give the house of God a definition, something that we searched for to say, what are we? Uh, because uh, we were never really clear on what it was we, uh, we were. And when he said Hebrew Pentecostal, that uh, aligned with our belief system and, and uh, focused our attention uh, on several core issues. Uh, the issues were the Sabbath day, and at the time, to an extent, the observance of our holy days, particularly Passover and so forth. And that satisfies us uh, to, a, to an extent. And it, uh, it brought clarity to a few things, but at the same time, it created questions and left questions to be asked about what, what then do we believe? More importantly, um, how do we explain to our employers uh, you know, when we want to be off on holy days on to our children's teachers at school and so forth. Um, what do we tell them when we're off on uh, Jewish quote unquote holidays? Um, are we Jews? Uh, do we tell them that we're Jews? And if so, where do we fit in the, uh, within that body of understanding regarding Judaism? Um, we had ministers uh, as well as our members who were equally as, as, miffed when it came to trying to describe exactly uh, what we believe and uh, where we came from. They struggled with that. Um, there were many who thought that we were one of the lost tribes. I remember that discussion well, and there were others that felt like we were, were black Jews, um, and still others who just said, no, we'd like to explain it. If you took the opportunity to ask uh, one of one of our House of God members, uh, who are we, and uh, what do we believe, and why do we believe that, uh, you would find that you get a variety of answers. Uh, mostly we pull out a list of things of do's and don'ts. This is what we do, and this is what we don't do. We, uh, we, we, we keep the Sabbath, we eat clean, we go through all of that. We, you know, we dress a certain way, and 
and uh, they would go down. We don't go to the movies. We don't smoke. We don't drink. Drink. We don't dance. We we had a long list of, of things that represented our culture and our practices, but uh, not much that that helped us to explain exactly what it is that made us what we are. Um, so it, it became uh, an issue to search and try to see, is there a way to explain what we are? It's, I know as a child growing up in this church, this was a constant problem for me. Um, going, It was easier just to say that you were Jewish if, if, if you were, they understood that better than they did anything else. If you said, you know, if you said I'm Jewish, you know, that made it understandable. That's why you're off on Passover. That's why you're off on the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, etc. Uh, that's why you observe it. So with this in mind, um, we started out to try to identify what it is uh, uh, that we value. Why? Because the, as I started out explaining, those values are the things that we care about. The things that uh, that uh, that we invest in, uh, our essential practices. It is our belief system, and um, so uh, Apostle Clark. I remember it well at the Eastern Division meeting some uh, several years ago. I think it's 2011, 10, 11 in that time frame. Preached a sermon: define, cultivate, and grow. And uh, it was a striking sermon in that it. It started out saying, before we can do anything, we have to define it. We got to know what it is we're trying to become. Before we do anything, we have to know where we're trying to go, what it is we want to be. We have to understand what the destination is, uh, et cetera. So that define, cultivate, and grow stimulated uh, the my interest in trying to, to aggregate our belief system. Um, he further introduced something that uh, that became relevant. He called us uh, uh, everything that we do, he said, was centered around Christ. That is something that before that time we had, although we believed in Christ and that was not an issue. Some of us said we always believed in Christ, but not to the extent that he pushed that issue. He says we are a Christ-centered church. He is the center of everything we do, whether it's keeping the Sabbath or honoring the festival days, or what have you. It is about Christ, essentially that, and that we are a Bible-believing uh, church. So that gave us a new impetus to say, if we're Christ-centered and Bible-believing, we ought to be able to aggregate our beliefs into something that makes sense, that doesn't take 31 different answers to describe. Um, we are, there, there was a, a large body of, of Pentecostal believers, and, and within that group, they were diverse. Some of our Pentecostals uh, at that time, um, many of them uh, did not observe the Sabbath. Uh, some of them uh, did not observe the festival days. Uh, some did not uh, have a special diet, and so forth and so on. Although uh, the thing that we we did observe is that, you know, they believed in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Some baptized uh, in the Trinity, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I tried to ask the question, uh, what is it then that, that we have in common? What do we share? And how do we define uh, Hebrew Pentecostals worldwide? Our church began to grow. We were growing into Canada and Jamaica and Africa and other places. And as we went around the world, it became necessary for us to not only define ourselves, but to differentiate ourselves from other uh, Pentecostals. So that became the basis uh, for uh, this, this booklet. Um, we had to synthesize our belief system into something me meaningful. Uh, now, does it include everything? Absolutely not. Does it include all the values I expressed early on? Uh, no, it does not. That was not the intent. Um, we, we wanted to identify ourselves and, and to understand what a Hebrew Pentecostal was. So um, given that as a backdrop, we proceeded to look at the body of beliefs that we have. And I came up with just five. Um, 
Well, there, there were more, of course, but we, we settled on five. Because as I examined these five and poked at them, I found that the body of what we believe can be found and substantiated as biblical and centered around Christ, uh, given what Apostle Clark had preached. Uh, they're the bedrocks of, of our belief. They're non-negotiable things. Uh, and, and I found those five to be, number one, our observances. Uh, I stuffed into our observances the Sabbath and, and the festival days and, and, and so forth. Though that's our observances. And then our diet. We have a special diet. All of our Pentecostals don't have special diets. And we baptize in water by immersion, uh, not dipping and sprinkling, sprinkling and, and other forms um, and an indwelling of the Holy Spirit was another one of our core values. We believe that that was essential, uh, that you had to have the Holy Ghost. Uh, and lastly, the oneness. That was the fifth um, uh, value that I, I, I was able to identify. We did not believe in the Trinity. We didn't believe in the three and one. And we believed in one God. And uh, that set aside the Trinity. So Starting with that as, as our, our core values, I begin to, to examine them. Our first value was observances, and I want to talk more about that just briefly, and I hope I don't get too long. Um, first and foremost, we, we agreed we were seven-day Sabbath keepers. There was no contention in our ranks about that. And, and we observed the Sabbath from sun to sun, from sundown Friday until sundown Sabbath evening uh, at the going down of the sun and so forth. That's how we observed the Sabbath. Why? Because there were other groups who observed the Sabbath 12 hours during the day or they start midday Sabbath day to six o'clock. There, um, there, there are all kinds of variations on that theme, but, the, um, but we accepted the fact that we, our understanding of what, what God instituted in Genesis chapter one, he made it seven, a 24-hour day, and he rested on the seventh day, and we observed the Sabbath from sun to sun. Uh, we observed the festival days, uh, and, and that, that's a whole other subject, but gets into Leviticus chapter 23, which starts with the, the, the seven-day Sabbath, and then uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover and Pentecost and so forth. Those festival days, we accepted those. At the same time, uh, we rejected uh, pagan holidays like Christmas and, and Easter and New Year's and Halloween and Valentine's Day and so forth. We rejected those. So uh, observances became, are we observed the, the, the days that are detailed in the scriptures? We reject the pagan holidays that were instituted by other denominations. Um, we observed the practice of, of taking the, the Lord's uh, Supper once a year on ABIB 14. And someone may argue, well, we, we're not 100% there. Could be right. Some may take it at the beginning of the 14th day and some take it toward the end of the 14th day. But it's ABIB 14 and we take it once a year, not every third, fourth Sunday, first Sunday. We take the Lord's Supper once a year on the 14th day of ABIB. And um, um so that's one of the observances, uh, the Lord's Supper, you know, as, as it is detailed in, in Matthew chapter 28 and Mark 14 and Luke 22, etc. cetera. So um, that's our observances. That is core value number one. In addition to that, the second value that I looked at was diet. And I'm trying to go through these um, as quickly as I can, it's taking longer than I thought it would, Apostle, so you stop me if we need to. But uh, our diet is a special diet. It is not a kosher diet. The Jews observe a kosher diet, which has uh, in its very uh, understanding um, some very complicated things like the, the not mixing of meat and milk and so forth, those sorts of things. And this comes out of a very long tradition among the Jews, but they keep a kosher kitchen and so forth. House of God does not subscribe to kosher in the, in the, in the context in which is understood by, by Jews today. We adopted something called clean. It's a clean diet, clean as described in the scriptures. 
Uh, we know that, uh, for instance, and in, that there were three diets given to man starting in Genesis chapter 2 and so forth uh, and ended up in Leviticus chapter 11. Uh, but in 11, when God detailed these are the meats and so forth that he shall eat, um, he went through great detail and, and categorizing what we can eat among flesh, among the meat, among vegetables and so forth and, and whatnot. So the long and short of it is we have a diet that is called a clean diet, not a kosher diet. So as we start to answer the question, are we Jews? Well, if you want to be a Jew, you can be a Jew in here and not eat kosher diet because that's not part of what we do. Our values are we have a clean diet. Uh, our fish have fins and scales and so forth. You can have arguments about whether one fish has, and, and that went on for years. As I was a youngster, we, we, um, we had an argument about tuna. I remember it well when Bishop and uh, several of the uh, leaders of the church went to a fish market to look and see if a tuna had fins and or scales so that we could determine whether the church could eat them. We still have those kind of uh, arguments, but the long and short of it is there's no debate among us that we have a special diet. The next, uh, I'm moving on to the next core value was baptism. Uh, the majority of the uh, Christian religion, uh, faith, including uh, Pentecostals, practice baptizing uh, believers in accordance with the Trinitarian doctrine. So they believe in, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and, um, and they baptize in that vein. We accept uh, as valid baptism, that being emerged in water uh, and immersed in water, uh, as, as is demonstrated in, in uh, John, John's baptism, when John well, if you go to Matthew chapter 3, you see Jesus went down in the water. He went down, he came out of the water, and there's reasons for that, because it was a form uh, of death, burial, and resurrection. But the, the issue is that we believe in immersion, not sprinkling, dipping, and wiping, and so forth. Um, so baptism separates us. These are the things that differentiate us from others who are similarly disposed, who may call themselves Pentecostals. If you're a Pentecostal and I'm a Pentecostal, what makes you different? These are the things that our diet is different. Our observances are different. Uh, we baptize differently. And we think that uh, that is essential to salvation, as, uh, as was described in Acts chapter 2. Uh, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, etc. Next on our list was the indwelling. That's the next core value. We believe in the promise uh, that the Comforter in Acts chapter 1 came on the day of Pentecost. Um, our good Lord promised us that he wouldn't leave us alone, that he was going to send us a Comforter. And in Acts uh, chapter 2, when they were all gathered together with one accord and in one place, the, the Holy Ghost came in the form of the uh, uh, tongues of fire and sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So in that room, uh, that promise came. Uh, it represented the culmination of that covenant that God made with his people, a covenant that remains even today. It is the evidence of our inclusion, if you will, into the body uh, of Christ and our transformation from the old man, such as we were, uh, into uh, the new man. And that was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We know, and I'm going to start preaching, that the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in any unclean place. So there's some preparatory steps that has to be taken uh, before the Holy Ghost can come. Uh, Acts 2.38 said, repent first and be baptized second in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That was the steps. Um, you will find that um, uh, that was a blueprint if you will, for how one should uh, look forward to the indwelling. It will come, uh, but this is what you must do in order for it to come. Um, in the indwelling, um, uh, he went out from there. Christ came. Uh, he was, uh, we believe, in the virgin birth. Uh, it's not part of our, our um, five core values, but in, 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 ingrained in all of this is, is the fact that that uh, Christ came, uh, born of a virgin. He grew up as a carpenter's son. 
um, and so forth. And I'm get, going to go, we, we can go into that later, but he, he healed the sick and raised the dead and gave sight to the blind and so forth. And then he went to the cross, hung there and um, hung on the cross and, and gave uh, his life for our sins. He hung there and uh, he rose at the end of the Sabbath in Matthew 28 and 1 as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week and send it up into heaven and so forth. So we believe in that. And we believe in him, our next core value, the oneness, if you will, of the creator. We don't, as I said previously, we set aside the Trinity because we believe in one God. Uh, he does not share uh, his power, his authority uh, with any other entity. He stands alone as the supreme head of the church. And we believe that God himself took on many forms. He took on the form, wrapped himself in flesh came down to earth, presented himself to man in order to redeem him. Um, he, he went through the process of being laid in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes and so forth. And then uh, putting himself um, up to be like us. Uh, so we believe in oneness. So there, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up because I, I see my time. I'm already at 835 and I'm getting, I won't have much time for questions. There are five core values, the first one being our observances and, and what these values are. These are the things that are non-negotiable that differentiate us. They define us, number one. They differentiate us, number two. In other words, they separate us from other Pentecostals and even Seventh-day Pentecostals in that it is our observances and that we observe the Sabbath, the feast days, and so forth. It is our Diet, we have a, spe a special, I call a clean diet, not a kosher one. It is baptism. We baptize in water by immersion, uh, not dipping and sprinkling. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and as and there's an argument, is it a evidence or is it the evidence? Uh, but they on, on in Acts chapter 2, they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. It was the evidence of the Holy Ghost there. Um, and last of all, the oneness of the creator, we believe in one God, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So those are five core values. And when I have to explain this, ironically, uh, people understand it. I use those five points. Uh, they understand it at school without going into the detail. They understand it on the jobs. Uh, other preacher friends of mine understand it. I have a very close friend of mine, a Baptist minister, Doug Motley, some of y'all know him, he preached for us many times. We, When we were in school, we used to argue tooth, tooth and nail about things, but when I took this approach in explaining to him what differentiates us, he understood it. He said, George, good approach. I was, I was pleased with hearing that because he being outside of our organization understood that that made sense to him. So oneness of the creator and so forth. So I, I will try to cut it off there, Apostle, without going any further. We're already uh, 36 or 37 minutes in. I'll stop there and entertain any questions someone may have or to uh, clarify anything that I've said thus far. Apostle Daly, I sent you a text. Um, I don't know if you can see it or not, but... Um... You, you could have gone on. I mean, this this is your night. This is your time. We just, uh, you know, if somebody have a question, they can uh, uh, pose a question now. We have, like I said, we have several pastors on as well as individuals. And we're talking about the core value, and you know that we're going to get into that discussion. But if there's anyone that said, okay, Apostle, I heard what you said, but I'm confused about this, or could you clear up that piece? Please feel free to do so now. Um. Yeah, there, there's one thing that I want to, before you get started, I did say these are not all, all of the values. I said there are thousands of values, and all of the values can't be core. All of them are not as significant. One is as significant as the other. But we have tried to synthesize down what we believe into five core areas. Now, when you look at that and identifying who we are, number one, and how it differentiates us from others, let me just give you an example. Uh, for us, uh, I'll use the Church of God in Christ, whom I have many good friends in. I have nothing against them whatsoever. Uh, but here's the difference. I said, how do you differ from Church of God in Christ? Well, uh, let me just take our, our observances. 
we observe the seven day Sabbath. The Church of God in Christ worships on Sunday, which is fine. We have a special or clean diet. Uh, the Church of God in Christ does not have a clean. So these things differentiate us from them. Um, well, how do you differ from uh, the seven day Adventists? They're Sabbath keepers. Yes, they are. Uh, the seven day Adventists do not. Uh, believe in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, for instance, neither do they keep the festival days. These are things that makes us different. And I want to make certain that you understand um, uh, this part of it, that it differentiates us, it defines us and differentiates us from others, but by no means does it try to be all inclusive because there are many things that I did not mention. An example, uh, would be for tithing. Somebody said, well, is it essential? Yes, it is essential. Why didn't you mention it? Because it doesn't differentiate us. There's no church in, in, in the United States that I know of that doesn't collect tithes and offerings. I don't care what denomination they are. So it, it standalone does not differentiate us and so forth. And I just, I made that example. I used that example to make clear that uh, there are certain things that we do that everybody does, and therefore they're not included in our core value. It doesn't mean they're not values. They are. They're not things that we, uh, we, we hold dear. They are, but they're not core because they don't differentiate us from others. So I wanted to back up and get that point clear. I'm sorry, uh, Pastor. Yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm glad you did that. Um, any of the, those who are sharing with us tonight have a, have a point or a question they would like to ask and maybe get some clarity on? I do, Apostle. Would you identify, and I know who you are, but we have several people on tonight from other, um, other cities, states. We have all over the country from Virginia to California. So um, would you identify yourself when you speak so they can know who you are? Thank you, Sister Shannon. Yes, I'm Sister Charmaine. I'm from Cobham, Apostle um, Raglan is my pastor. Um, my question is, I, I do understand the core values, um, how you've laid them out, and I do have the book. So when I look at the book, it talks about um, what, what our name is. So I guess my question is, who are we? Because you, we, we are called Hebrew Pentecostals. We're called. Um, there were several names that was given. Um, holy holiness commandment. So when, when I see somebody, somebody in the streets and they ask, "What denomination are you? Who who are you? Uh, how do you, how do you define that without going through a dissertation of the core values?" Uh, uh, thank you for, for the question. I think uh, that is exactly where we started, is how do you define who we are? Uh, Bishop S.P. Rawlings declared uh, 34 years ago that we were Hebrew Pentecostal. That's not something what, that we did with core values. When he did that, um, he did that at the, at the convocation, and he didn't give a lot of specifics about what that meant. There were probably some very good logical reasons for it at the time, uh, but the issue is he he gave us something that we didn't have before. We, you're right. We were called holiness. We were called holy rollers. We were called a lot of things, but he defined this church, the house of God, holy church of the living God, and this organization as Hebrew Pentecostal. So that's the answer I give. What denomination are you? We're Hebrew uh, Pentecostal. However, uh, when you get beyond that, you say, well, what does that mean? Now you got to, to, to go into, if I can just take a minute with you, we have five core values. It is our observances. It's our diet, you know, et cetera. It's the baptism and the indwelling and, and oneness. And if you, you have more time and want me to go into them, I can. But those are entry points to a discussion about what it is that makes us what we are and who we are. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. Thank you. Someone else have a question, a point. Yes. Um, praise the Lord, everyone. It's Marcel, Richmond, Virginia. My pastor is Bishop Oscar Palmer. Um, 
Apostle, when you had mentioned, you said, I have a lot of different friends in different denominations. And then you said, so the difference is, and then you said, um, the you say you had a friend in the church of God in Christ. The difference is um, you keep the seven day Sabbath and he keeps Sunday. And then you said that was fine. But the scripture says, um, the Sabbath shall be a sign between me and you that I'm your God and you are my people. So I don't understand it when you said that's fine. What do you mean when you say that? What I what I'm saying is it's fine that he's he keeps Sunday. That's all right. I mean, I mean, I keep Sabbath, he keeps Sunday. Fine that I have a, a clear definition of who I am and what he is. That doesn't mean that I agree with him that he's right. Um, I, I didn't mean to uh, infer that, uh, but I think for many years, many of us, uh, we were separatist. You know, right. we believed we were right and the world was wrong. And if people believe something different from us, we, we couldn't touch them. So right. for that stymied our growth and certainly wasn't what Jesus did. He demonstrated right. what he, when he went out among people, uh, he didn't wear a banner, you know, out. And, and as a matter of fact, he showed himself. He showed love and, and he mingled among them. He, he ate with sinners uh, to demonstrate, you know, here's, here's where I am. Different from you who are uh, holier than I am, holier than thou, that won't sit and, uh, with, with uh, someone that, that believes differently than perhaps you do. So when yeah. I say... I, I do have friends. I have friends now in, in other denominations and Baptist churches and, and Methodist churches. I have preached in Baptist churches and Methodist churches on an annual basis. And I have uh, uh, friends in many other Pentecostal churches as well. Uh, that doesn't mean I agree with them that they're right. Even within our own denomination, there are those of us who have disagreements about points of doctrine and things. That's okay. We can we can uh, we can agree to disagree. Um, uh, the Bible tells us to come, let us reason together. But that doesn't mean that we all are going to agree on every point because we don't. That's a given. But I, I I really would like for us to understand that core values is is not so much for other people. It is for us to have a clear understanding of who we are and what we are and what what differentiates or separates us from others yes. who may be Thank Pentecostal you. as well. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I have a question. And you are? I'm Joyce Jones. Oh. I, uh, <laughs> 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 um, we're like, we're newcomers to um to the house of God in Cobham. And when I tried to, when I tried to explain it to um, some of my family or coworkers, the first thing they would say to me is, oh yeah, that's Muslim. I'm like, no. So my question is, what is the difference between Hebrews, Pentecostal and Muslim? <laughs> uh, no. Um, no, well, it's a good question. And, and the reason I, uh, this question has come up uh, a number of times but first of all, you know, I study various religions. You know, I've read the Bhagavad Gita. I've read the Quran. I, and I do that only for one reason, to understand what other people believe. You can't say someone else is wrong if you don't understand what they believe. You understand? So in my yeah. position, I have to know what they believe before I'm going to stand in their face and say, you're wrong. I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. First of all, I want to know what I believe. But right. when you're talking to a Muslim or you're talking to a Hindu or you're talking and, and you want to talk about Lord Krishna or you want to talk about uh, another another denomination or another, you first need to understand what it is about. They have deities that is not the, the true and living God. We believe in one God. We believe in uh, he is holy and he is and he reigns supreme and doesn't share his uh, power with no other. And so if you talk about uh, uh, Muslim, and I want to be very careful here, you talk about Muslims or anyone else. Uh, if you're not talking about the God of heaven, right. you understand, then, then we're not on the same page. 
Um, when I was uh, studying theology years ago, Anselm, the Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote a book uh, called the, the Philosophy of Religion. And uh, what he talked about in that book, he said, that then which a greater cannot be thought is what I'm talking about. That's God. He said, and the reason that I use that vernacular is because uh, we have labels on everything. You know, you call him uh, God uh, or Yahweh. I call him Buddha. Uh, someone else calls him something else and so forth and so on. He says, but that then which a greater cannot be thought is what we're talking about. There is no greater entity nowhere, nowhere else in existence other than God. When you talk about it like that, there's one God that knocks these other, that's what the Egyptians, they had many, many gods in Egypt. That's exactly what God was an affronting when he brought the plagues uh, to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He, he confronted them with, with, with lice and flies and, and blood and so forth because there were gods that or deities, if you will, uh, that they worshiped and that had no power. But uh, when I'm talking to a, a, a Muslim, I'm not going to be a confrontational. Uh, I know what he believes, and I know why he believes it. But where we part company, I believe in the one God. That's why that last principle, oneness of the creator, I believe in one. And it's not Buddha, and it's not Lord Krishna, and it's not, it is Yahweh, the God of heaven. Okay. Thank you, Sister Jones. Someone else have a question or point they'd like to make? No, no we're not going to have Apostle um, daily on every night doing our discussion every Friday night. So take the opportunity now to get some clarity. Because um, I know many of you have read the uh, the book, the, the book that we, he was referencing and I showed you earlier. If you haven't already to prepare yourself for our discussion, you can go on Amazon and get it. I believe it's four ninety nine, and you know, just a, a pamphlet, but it's still a booklet, but it's still well worth the, the knowledge. And um, so, in reading that, you're going to have questions. And so, if something comes to your mind now, don't hesitate to ask. And um, and some of our ministers that are on tonight, our uh, apostle board representatives and bishops and whatnot. If you have a point you would like to make to enhance what's already been said, please do so. Yes, I would appreciate the help. I think I saw Apostle Clark uh, 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 log on and, and Wallace too, so I know we have help out there. And we have um, Apostle Owens is our own Apostle Woodard, so yeah. Yeah, these, Raglan. <laughs> these are members of the Apostle Board. Uh, so the Apostle Board we are represented tonight. So please, sirs. Apostle Raglan, this is Deacon Preston. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Apostle Daly, have thoroughly enjoyed the, um, your presentation tonight. My, my question for you, Apostle Daly, is do, our, do you feel that our core values are linked to salvation or do I only need Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for salvation? Where's, what's your view on that? Uh, let me be clear on what you're asking. You say, do you only need the core values for salvation? No, only Jesus Christ for salvation. Do the core values have anything to do with our salvation? Absolutely. Uh, where I, when I, in my discourse, I said, Apostle Clark went back in at the Eastern Division meeting and preached a sermon to find, cultivate, and grow. And uh, from that, you know, I, I went and said, he went further to said, we are Christ-centered church. And everything that we do is centered around Christ. So when you ask the question, when you look at the core values, everything in that core value is focused on Christ. There are a bunch of things, uh, Deacon Preston, that I did not uh, get into that I said our values. There are things that are left outside of the five core values because they're not core. There are things that we we definitely believe and things that we definitely do. Their practices and their, as a matter of fact, there's a, a segment that I did not talk about. It is where our customs and practices intersect you know, with our values. 
And uh, it's something probably that, that has a whole nother discussion because there are many things that we do uh, that are fine things. You know, they're just practices of ours and we do it and it's okay. Um, even our form of worship, you know, form of, uh, you, and so forth. You say, is that essential to salvation? Well, you know, I don't tie it uh, to essential to salvation like Acts 2.38 said, repent, uh, be baptized, every one of you. No, but uh, there we can, we have bunches of other scriptures that talks about obedience. It, we have to put things in context and say, what are we talking about here? You know, uh, what is the mandate and, and where are we with this? But my, 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 my pet answer to you, the five core values are essential to salvation. There are many other values outside of the five that are essential to salvation as well. And uh, to answer the question, do we need, uh, we need the five core values? Absolutely. Uh, in order to be saved. Um, and I think you asked it more along, along the line, do we need it uh, or do we need Jesus Christ? I say if we have Christ, we're going to have all of these things because they all are focused on him. Thank you, Apostle Daly. We are commandment keepers. Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, we can go on and on and on with that, but I'm just saying... It is focused, our Sabbath keeping, our observance of the feast days, you know, they're, they're all focused on Christ. And as Apostle, you want to get deeper in the past, the present, and the future, um, you know, you, you can put those feast days and other things that we do in context of what we used to do, what we do now, and what we will be doing, and what is the significance of those things in the world to come. So there's a lot that we can talk about, but I think it, it takes this whole discussion somewhere we're probably not ready for tonight. Yeah. I, I would just like to make a comment. Uh, I am thoroughly enjoying this, Apostle Daly, this is uh, Pastor Palmer, Richmond, Virginia. Um, uh, Hebrew Pentecostal, when I uh, think about, you know, who we are, uh, my, my mind... Uh, goes back and the scripture bears witness concerning uh, and I'd just like to read this one verse uh, maybe two verses Hebrews 10 uh, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days said the Lord I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquity will I remember no more, no more. No. so when I when I see that we now, as Hebrew Pentecostal believers, we enter in by a better way in which the Leviticus priesthood or that system could not suffice God and it would not help us as well. So Christ did, did away with that, uh, changed the priesthood, and now we now enter in um, by that new way in which he has provided for us. So when I think about Hebrew Pentecostal, uh, Hebrew Pentecostalism, to explain that is just say, you know, we still have the commandments. Uh, and he sh and the, the writer in Hebrews was quoting Jeremiah 31 and 31 as well as we know. But the difference is, when we see Hebrews 10, what I just read, he, he was talking about putting these laws in a redeemed or regenerated person. He wasn't talking about writing this as the Holy Ghost witness, doing it to someone that's unredeemed. So we understand with Christ, you know, being our high priest now, um, and he's writing it in our minds and in our hearts, that's new heart. That's new mind. That's new spirit and sealed with the spirit of God. So that's the way I would explain, you know, Hebrew um, Pente um, Pentecostal or Pente Pentecostalism. That's where I would explain it because what they couldn't do under that old system, we can do it now because of the new system that has been ratified through the blood of Christ. So now, yeah, we are the new creatures. We do enter in by a better way in which Christ is provided through his body. So, you know, I can, you can talk about the oneness. You can talk about the indwelling. You can talk about the baptism, you know, all of that because of what Christ does. And that's who we are. Because sometimes when, when you say Hebrew, first thing is, oh, y'all Jews or, oh, y'all under the law. Well, understand that I got a new heart and I got a new mind. 
that Christ has given me. This is what God said he was going to give his people and he was going to take their iniquities away. That's what he done. But he didn't take those those commandments and laws away from them because he put it in their heart. I think that uh, you, you make a very good point there, uh, Pastor Palmer. Um, you, like many of our preachers, are you're a level or two uh, ahead of where I would go with this for opening. Um, the 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 core values were not, was not written. What you just explained is a great topic for Bible class. But when you're talking to a teacher in the classroom, or a um, or or an employer because you want to be off on the Sabbath. That was the, 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 the first focus, is to give you simple language that you could use to explain. Uh, I never heard of Hebrew Pentecostal, someone would say. You know, what is that? I know what Pentecostal is, and I know what is Hebrew Pentecostal is the problem that we were struggling with always. And uh, rather than going deep, which I tend not to do, I don't want to be deep. I can be deep. Uh, you know, it's like uh, we can, I always say, you know, I can indict a hamburger sandwich. I really can, using the scriptures, uh, because most preachers can do that. You know, we, we use scriptures and we, 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 we tape them together and point them at things and we can indict anything. But when it comes to explaining simple things like what are you, who are you, where, and you're talking to someone who doesn't necessarily share your particular uh, theology or your view of the world, you need some simple, uh, a simple way of doing that so that they understand. Now, us biblical scholars, I'm 100% with you and I understand that, but I'm, I'm trying to help that person um, who comes in and says, you know, my, 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 my teacher wants to know, am I Jewish? That your, your child that's in your Sabbath school or something of like that. And your answer is, no, I'm not Jewish per se. A lot of our folk will say, yes, we are. We're black Jews. Um, you open up a whole nother can of worms. Um, so I, I want you to know what the focus of this book was, since you're going to be coming at it from doing a series on this book. It's a simple approach to how do we explain Hebrew Pentecostalism to a non-believer or one person outside of our organization perhaps some that are inside too, because I'm not sure that everybody uh, inside understands. Apostle, <clears throat> um, dearly, I think you make an excellent point because that's what we see that, you know, we have great people. We have people that love the Lord, they study the word, but when it comes down to who we are, a lot of times the, they, they struggle with trying to identify, as you said, to, um, to an employer, to a school system, to whomever, they, they struggle with trying to explain who we are. And I think um, using this um, core values system, just pointing out these five things that dis have a distinction as to who we are, it's just a, a simple way of making sure that everybody in our church and our churches can say, okay, I got it, I can explain it. And I'm comfortable with it. This is what happens so many times in our, in our churches is that when the members are confronted about who you are, uh, unfortunately, many times they will refer you back to the pastor. Well, call my pastor. Uh, um, he or she will explain to you who we are and when, when, what this Hebrew Pentecostalism is. That's not, the, that's not where we should be. Every member of the house of God should be able to, with simplicity, explain who we are. It's not as easy as, as we think. Uh, sometimes we get, we, we get um, caught up in, in the difficult conversations that confuse people. And the only thing we want to do is keep this a Christ-centered Bible-believing church. It's Christ-centered, as, as Brother, as Deacon Preston asked, you know, it, this is a Christ-centered church, and everything we do uh, is centered around Christ. It points to Christ. So y'all are Christians. Yes, we are. Some of our, our, our Hebrew Pentecostals are afraid to say, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I, I, I'm proud of that, and I don't have any problem saying it. You know, I'm a Christian. So they, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Um, you know, and then these are the things that if you really want to know how we worship, 
we were, I'm asking, uh, I don't work on the Sabbath because Sabbath is my worship day. That's one of our observances. It's our core value number one. And that's not the only worship day we have. We got, you know, the Sabbath, then we got feast days and so forth. But where does that all fit in? Where does Judaism fit in it? Because there's the um, uh, Hebrew Pentecostalism. There's a pamphlet that I wrote years ago called um, Hebrew Pentecostalism. What is it? Uh, and it, and it, it, it says that it's like marrying water and oil. You take oil and water and you try to mix them. They don't mix well. If you take uh, Pentecostal, the New Testament and the Old Testament, try to mix it, you don't, it doesn't mix well unless you have a catalyst. If you put the water and oil in a, in a cup and stir it up, it won't mix. You drop a little so, uh, soap a powder or something in there, suddenly it mixes. And so if you can find that catalyst, uh, as in the New Testament, when Christ said, think not that I come to destroy the law, we are in the Old Testament. He says, think not that I come to destroy the law, nor the prophets. I didn't come to destroy it. I came that it might be fulfilled. So therefore, and he says, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. Now, I want to, you want to get deep, we'll go deep, but let's just keep it simple and say Christ did not do away with the law. He simplified it. He clarified it, you know. He says in the Old Testament, he said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her have committed adultery in his heart already. Mm -hmm. He said, the law remains, as Apostle Clark has said to us. Uh, the, the law remains. It's the interpretation of the law that changed. Mm -hmm. the, so I think that what we want to do is to not get complicated. We want to try to stay simple. Try to keep it simple so that your teachers, your your work people that work with you, even other ministers that want to understand, they, they will finally get there. I mean, they can go deep with you when I know my friends do. Uh, they, they'll take you there real quickly, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. I say, let's go there. But the issue is that somebody who's a, a newbie or someone who has not learned in the scriptures, they will have a tougher time trying to defend it. And, and to that extent, I want to give them what I call simplified language, something yeah. simple that they will remember. You know, it's just our observances. It's our diet. It's the baptism. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's the oneness. That's really the five things that, that are core different, uh, different from uh, what you'll find in, in the Christian world. How does that differ from the, that's how it differs. Mm -hmm. They're different and they're non-negotiable. That's what I put up in the beginning. Those differences are not negotiable. Sabbath is not negotiable. Feast days is not negotiable. Those things are not going to, baptism is not, the indwelling is not negotiable. You either got it or you don't. You don't have it, you're going to hell. That's how strongly we believe in it. Wow. Um, Sister Simone Adams of Washington, D.C. have a point she would like to make. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Apostle Daly, I just want to uh, thank you um, for this presentation. Um, I don't care how long we've been in the house. Um, it's helpful. It's always good to uh, listen and to uh, get more information um, because, you know, we run into people or, you know, we are fellowshipping with people who are struggling with these things. You know, there are people that have been in the house for years and they still struggle on how to explain uh, what they do and who they are. Um, I thank you so much for breaking down and telling us about um, what defines us and what differentiates us. That was um, really key uh, for me to help me um, in my understanding and also to, to be able to explain to someone else. Um, and then we were talking about different religions and the one thing that you said that stood out was understanding who you are. Um, you know, you will run into people that worship and, you know, believe different things. But when you yourself understand who you are, who you yeah, belong right. to, 
um, and what those things are, you hold them dear, you study who you are, then when you run up against other things, when other things are presented to you, you're able to stand, you're able to explain, and you're able to not be swayed. Um, and I do, and I encourage people, um, I, I like what you said about how you, um, you have researched other religions, not because you were looking for that or that that was something that you wanted to uh, explore yourself, but you read up on it and educated yourself so that when you do talk to people, when you are presented with that, you already have an understanding of what it is that they do. Um, when you get that understanding, then you will know, no, I'm not Jewish. No, and I'm not going to label myself that. Uh, no, yeah. I'm not a black Jew. I'm not gonna label myself that because you've done your research and you already understand, no, that's who we are. No, and, and, and our late apostle, you were right. You said 34 years ago, he made the distinction on who we are. We need to embrace that, learn about it, understand it and stand on it. So I just thank you. Thank you so, so much for this presentation. Uh, it, it, it was so appreciated. And again, I don't care how long you've been in the house, new, middle of the way, old, all of this was needed. And, and, and you can learn, you can always learn. Thank you so much. Shabbat shalom. Yes, yes. Papa Owens. Yes, yes, I wasn't sure if, if you guys could hear me. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Can I uh, give a, what I use about Hebrew Pentecostal? Please. I tell, I tell even my friends in Israel, I tell them I'm not Jewish and they, they understand because they know that in order to be Jewish, you have to uh, teach and believe the Jewish law, which is called Halakha. So I tell them that I am a Hebrew Pentecostal because, first of all, that Abraham was a Hebrew. And his uh, name, uh, he, even when he went to Egypt, he was called Eber, which is Hebrew. And Abraham is the father of, is our father. Because the Bible says that Abraham would be the father of many nations. That's right. So I identify with Abraham as our father. And that the Hebrew comes from Abraham. And that it extends all the way back to him being the father of many nations. To me, that's simple. Absolutely. It's a great point, uh, Apostle. Thank you. Um, praise the Lord, everybody. This is Sister Minnie Turner and uh, Apostle Rag uh, Daily. I came out from under Bishop Charles Hood, and all these years until tonight, I never knew he would tell us that we were Hebrew national, but I never felt comfortable in explaining it. I never really understood it, but now through your teaching and, and, and explaining, I feel so much comfortable and seeing who I am, knowing these cores of the value. I understand now, and I can truly feel comfortable if somebody, when they ask me, I mean, I was so uncomfortable in saying that I was here. What does that mean? I didn't know what it meant. But tonight, I thank God for your teaching, for your knowledge, for the wisdom God has put in you to explain it to us. I am so much comfortable in saying what I am, who I am, by the grace of God. Thank you. And God bless you. God bless you. Amen. There is a um, the right. Rodney Ashley um, have a question or comment? Uh, yes. Um, I was uh, wanted to say I appreciate the sermon and I mean the, the explain explanation of Pentecostal and. Um, and I was just listening to you earlier when you were saying how uh, you had mentioned all different Pentecostal um, religious uh, groups that there are. And uh, I heard you mention um, L.G. White. And, um, and I was just wondering, uh, 
through all these all these different Pentecostals, we still had the same belief, we still had the same core values, or where do the core values differentiate? And um, I was just wondering about that because God is so good and he does, I do see him throughout the different churches and, um, and I mean, it's hard to just uh, pinpoint what what we what Pentecostal religious you want, religion you want to be in. That's what I was just wondering about. Could you explain that difference to me? I see. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, other denominations don't necessarily use or subscribe to the core values. That was that was specifically for us. It tried to take what we what we know and believe and hold dear and synthesize that into something that we can explain. And that's why it is for us. And it's simplified. You notice I don't try to use a lot of scriptures here and whatnot. I, there are scriptures that everything we have in there is biblical, but I try not to confuse my audience just simply to lay values and simplify language on their mind so that they can use it when they need it. Because many of us are not going to remember scriptures as long as we've been in the church, we don't know them. Um, and uh, so for, for some, it's fine. Others, you know, I think what we want to do is to, just as you indicate, uh, to have it so that people can explain it. Now, in other denominations, no. Um, when, when I mentioned uh, other uh, principles like uh, Ellen White, for instance, for Seventh-day Adventist, her and her husband both were members of the Church of God years ago. That's okay. Uh, I'm saying they did not stay. Uh, the Church of God and, uh, had to extricate them because of Ellen's dreams and her beliefs. Uh, but the issue is that many of us have a common genesis, a common beginning. And uh, that much we do want to understand. Who can we talk to and why? You know, many people have, there are many uh, Sabbath keepers who have left the Sabbath and gone in the first day and so forth. Um, you know, that's an opportunity for dialogue as far as I'm concerned. You know, of course, I'm a preacher. You're, uh, there are those of us who are not. But uh, for me, I want to know where they came from. I know what they believed and why they believed that and what caused them to, to change. So that's an opportunity to have a dialogue uh, with them. But uh, I am hopeful that there's something simple in this book or booklet that, uh, and if you, if there's something that you think needs updating, this is 20, 2020. And if there's something that you think we need to put in there to help clarify or simplify what we do in this day and time, please feel free. Uh, I have no pride of authorship whatsoever. So uh, let me know and we will look at it to see in the next version if we can update it and include your thoughts. Apostle Daly, um, we have probably over 125 people on tonight. But to, and that's not individuals. That's sometimes that's households because when you're doing Zoom, you got multiple people, you know, in the house. And um, so we're talking about 125 or so contacts. Um, it was. I just got a text from one of the brethren that suggested that uh, we will, because we could be doing this for several weeks, that we would take questions. And we'll compile those questions and send them to you. And maybe at some point during this study, what we will actually do is um, have you come back on and um, kind of address the questions, give you a chance to, you know, have some time to look at the actual written questions. If you were available to do that, give a moment to think about it. And Apostle Woodard is trying to uh, share something with us. Yeah, thank you. Um, so glad to see everyone on tonight. I, uh, I remember I was at the old church and I came outside and there was a young man looking at the sign. And I said, what do you think? He said, Hebrew Pentecostal. I said, yes. He said, well, that's a new one to me. I said, <laughs> well, I said, what do you think? He said, well, I, I, I really don't know. I said, well, let me tell you what we believe. And this is what I teach in the church. And I tell them, keep it simple, as Apostle Dolly was saying. Keep, keep it simple because you get deep and wonderful and you lose people. I said, we believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I said, we believe 
in God's holy days. I said, we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We believe that he died and he rose again. He said, oh, I said, now let me tell you this. But he said, so you believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament? So you Jewish? I said, no. I said, the reason why we say Hebrew Pentecostal, I said, the reason why we don't say Jewish because majority of the Jews don't accept Jesus Christ. I said, so the difference with us, we observe the holy days for their God holy days. I said, we believe in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He stopped and said, wow. Whoa. He said, I said, very simple. I said, so um, I, I tried to explain to people, you know, I said, you don't have to be nervous about, you know, Hebrew Pentecostal. And you can explain that I believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but we don't, I, and this is what I got him when I said, but we don't observe pagan holidays. Amen. You don't observe Easter? I said, no. I said, you don't? I, and I said, well, we don't want to go into that because you need to come to Bible class. Now I'm trying to get you to come to Bible class now and do some teaching. But I, I try to make it simple, just telling them that we believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus Christ and our Lord and Savior, you know, but we don't observe pagan holidays. He was just astonished and said, oh, that's some, that's really something new, something new. And I said, yeah, you know, so as uh, some of you all were saying, we try to keep it simple so a person can understand. And then if they want to come to class, then you can give them some, you know, ex explain it to them, you know, I just want to say that. Well, I'll just say, um, you know, thank you, Apostle Woodard. Anytime that you have people who are new to your congregation, one of the things they struggle with greatest is observance. Now, Seventh-day Sabbath, when they come in, they already automatically know that you are a Seventh-day Sabbath observance church. But then when you get into uh, holidays versus holy days, um, you know, we, we say we have uh, people that have been with us for a while now and have Bible discussions and have worship service through Zoom and whatnot and in our Sabbath school. And we have not touched the surface hardly of, um, of, of holidays versus holy days. And, they, and I thank God they've been with us through the, um, through the holy days, through the fall festivals and some was with us through the spring festivals, but we have not had an opportunity. And that's one of the, that's as you see, has outlined in the, in this book, the first one we'll be talking about is uh, observance. So I know for some of our brothers and sisters who are sharing with us tonight have a plethora of questions when it comes down to uh, holidays. And because one of the biggest holidays of the year is rapidly approaching, and uh, prayerfully, we have an opportunity to discuss uh, some of the observance before before the uh, before the holiday get here. And and you know. Um, and we let people understand it and, and make up their mind, wow, do I want to give this up? Or when I say give it up, give it up for the, for the way it was taught to me. And can I accept um, what the Bible says about it? Any, any comments, any other comments? Apostle Raglan and to um, Apostle Daly, God bless all of you. All. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Um, I wish to God when I came around here in August of 80, which is a little over 40 years ago, that this um, information had been available um, to me. Um, our late Chief Apostle um, S.P. Rollins made a statement one year during our convocation and talking about what we believe and made this statement that we should do things in a way that will cause people to be inquisitive about what we do rather than shun what we do. And so um, um, I, uh, I want to say to Apostle Dale, I, I have greatly enjoyed this tonight. And there was one line statement that you made that I just want to hit on real quick. You said, let what you say and how you say be entry points into a discussion. And so that's kind of my you know, having come out of the first day church um, and to the Sabbath. And I'm going to tell you, when I, when all this hit me, when I came into the church and people was telling me, you know, that I, 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 I denounced the faith and, and all that was done away with, you know, it was my conviction by the word of God that helped me. 
because I know that God is right. Let every let God be true and every man a liar. But the point of the fact that um, now, as I do my best to help others who are not a part of us, and um, I, I kind of put things in and make them inquire, wow, I never thought about that. Um, I was never taught that. Um, not to be dogmatic, but, you know, he that wins souls is wise. And so I think this, this information with the five core values um, lays a wonderful foundation for what we believe since we're not like everybody else in what we believe. And then as has already been said by some others, um, that as we talk to others and share with others, it will cause them to want to come to either Bible study or Sabbath school or inquire even the more so that they will become um, true disciples and followers of Christ. So I just want to say, Apostle Dale, this was wonderful. And um, I think this was just plain. I think it was very plain and to the point. God bless you real good. I'm Thank you, Mr. Askew. You. Uh, yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons why when we, I personally, when I'm talking to people, anybody who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I respect the fact that they are a member of the body of Christ. Now that you are a member of the body of Christ, what well, our job is to help you understand what you are a member of. Uh, not a member of any particular church, but as a member of the body of Christ, what does what does Christ expect of his those that are his members? And that's why, you know, even we have people that, sh that share with us and and I tell them this, they talk about joining the church. Yes, of course you can join. We want you to join. But let's get the understanding that you're already a member of the body of Christ. And if you, you, know, if you choose to worship here, we want to help you along in this process of explaining what God expects, uh, what Christ expects from those that are in his body. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions or comments? There's a question in your, in your um, chat. Apostle. A question from Facebook. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the call to wait a minute, Star of David. Why was it chosen? Why does it, what does it represent? Apostle, let me, Apostle Dylan, let me read that again. If you see it in chat, this is from Facebook. I'm curious about the call to Star of David. Why was it chosen? What does it represent? Would you like to address that? The the one word that I'm missing is call. You said I'm I'm curious about the call. Uh, they said like you know it's called the Star of David. Why was that? Um, why was that chosen? What does it represent? Oh, the Star of David has has been an emblem for us for a number of years. It, it represented Mogan David, the, the 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 emblem that was on supposedly on on David's shield. Uh, and so forth. There's a lot of history about that, but why it's a part of what we, uh, it's just because it's a carryover from years ago, which is fine. And, and, and as, as, as a um, personal point, we modified the uh, logo of the church instead of having a star uh, standalone, which was already uh, representative of, of the nation of Israel. Um, and we were violating some very important uh, patents. We, we put the cross in it too because we said we were both Hebrew and Pentecostal and the star and the cross represents both of those. So I don't, when you said call, I'm trying to be sure that I'm getting what she, whoever is asking the question is getting at. We have a star of David with a cross in it that says we believe in both. We have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament as well. We believe in the coming Savior um, and so forth. So, I mean, um, I don't know what it what it stands for beyond that other than the fact that it's a logo. It's a logo that represents the church, just like the Methodist church uh, will have a, a red flag, uh, you know, on a... On, on well, a yeah. Uh, yeah, et cetera. And others, everyone has a logo. We have one. But that uh, tends to draw out the fact that we are both Hebrew and Pentecostal. That's why we have a, uh, the star alone did not tell the story because it says we, uh, I've had people walk into the National Temple. I had a young lady once walk in to the National Temple. I was there working and she came up and asked, what, what time does Shabbat services start, etc. cetera. It's a, a Caucasian lady. 
And I said, this is not a temple. Uh, this is not a Jewish synagogue. This is a church. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought it was a synagogue. I saw the Star David outside. Um, so I think it's important. That's why we made that adjustment so that people will know it's not a standalone star, but it's a star with the, with the cross on it. And I hope that you're making reference to that and not just a standalone Star of David. When the nation of Israel was born in 1949, they adopted that Star of David. And that's, you know, that belongs to them, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. And we embrace them and many things. But we included the cross with that star to point out that you're not looking at that standalone star. You're looking at a star with a cross in it. And you don't have a crucifix with Jesus on it because he got down off of that thing. Man. So, I mean, there's a lot of. Uh... Apostle, that's the question. We talk about observance. The question yes. has come about, what about the Feast of Dedication? Didn't Jesus go up John 10, 22? Um, you know, uh, Feast uh, of Dedication. And, I, you know, this comes up from time to time. It's not a feast that's in um, Leviticus 23. And but we, not everybody may, may recognize how it came about, why Jesus observed it, and how we approach it today. I think you hit the nail on the head. We go back to Leviticus 23. Um, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel concerning my feast, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. And six days shall work be done. And he goes on and on. And he enumerates the yeah. feast days uh, that you should remember. That, that became the mandate. The seventh day Sabbath was the first feast days mentioned, and he went through all of them. And so the ones that he mentioned, we observe. If he didn't mention them, Purim and other things that are there, Hanukkah, we don't observe them. There's no mandate to memorialize them. So if they're in the scripture, we remember. We're a Bible-believing church. If it's in the Bible and, and it's there as a mandate for us to keep, we keep it. So that's the reason why. If it's not there, we don't. All right. Um, any other questions or comments before we um, close tonight? You have been a great audience. Um, again, we will, if you have questions about um, the core value and send them to our secretary, Sister Brenda, we'll see what we have. Uh, we will compile them and then we'll send them to Apostle Daly for his review and we will see where we go from there. To those who share with us on a regular basis, that are not members of the house of God. I trust this has been enlightening to you tonight. I know you may have a plethora of questions and we will over the next several weeks uh, attempt to answer your questions. And we trust that those who are with us tonight will come back with us uh, eight o'clock each Friday night as we go through these core values and you have a chance to bring the, your discussion, bring your ideas, your thoughts and Again, we thank you. Thank you, uh, Pastor Daly. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Bishop Palmer if he would give us the benediction. Now, after the benediction, it is our custom here in Cobham that after the benediction, we'll go to our, our gallery, our view, go to a full gallery, um, unmute your phones and, and show your faces. And we're just what we call our, our social hall. And we just spent a few minutes just sharing and um, communicating with one another pleasantries. Uh, Bishop Palmer. Praise you, Father. We want to thank you, Lord, for uh, allowing uh, the assembly to come together tonight via Zoom and Facebook Live. We want to thank you, Father, for our presenter, Apostle Daly, and for all uh, brothers and sisters in Christ being on, for uh, Apostle Ragan, uh, them hosting um, these services. And we ask you, Father, that you will continue to Bless your, your man, man servant, Apostle Daly, that he would continue to speak uh, with clarity and, and, and give us the wisdom that you've given unto him, Lord God, concerning uh, our core values, God, that we may present this uh, in a simple way that people will understand um, who we are, Father, in the name of Jesus. We pray, Father, that you would bless every household that represented here and remember the sick and shut in and all. We ask you, Father, as we be... Uh, separated or dismissed from this setting, but never from your presence. Keep us in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Uh, Bishop.